Talent alone is definitely not enough because there are definitely going to be people out there who's willing to, to work harder than you. And the, the essence of diligence and what I believe in is that you don't have to be perfect to do something great, but you just got to show up with your best and that best can turn into something excellent. Hey guys, welcome to the Rebirth Podcast. I want to thank you guys for watching and for listening. In this podcast, we talk to individuals that have had to reinvent, recreate, and reimagine in order to grow. But before you watch and listen, I want to remind you to subscribe, to like, to review, and to share this episode and this podcast with everyone that you know. Thank you so much and enjoy. So my man, Charles, welcome to the Rebirth Podcast. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing great, man. What's up, JR? Yo, you got this big smile on your face, right? And it's, and it's so inviting. You, know, you, get, you have such a warm <laughs> smile. But, but, but what I want to know, man, is how does it feel to know that at one point you were like the sixth fastest man in the world? I don't, I don't know what that's like. I don't, I've, I've never been in the, you know, the, the top one millionth or two millionth or five millionth, you know? So, like, what is that feeling like to know you were the sixth fast, fastest man in the world? You know, you know, when you when you're in it, when you're in that state of flow and you've been doing it for so long, I think it almost becomes like a demand for your life. Mm. And not in a, a egotistical way, right? Because you work so hard on it. Every day of your life you spend perfecting this craft. You you get the full body cramps, you get those massages that you need, you right. show up early to practice, you're the last to leave. You do your warm up. You do your stretching. You 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 do that four by four that you don't want to do because you just finished running the two hundred and you only got thirty minutes to rest. And thirty minutes ain't enough to cool down. And so at at that point, it's like, yo, I I want this for my life. And that that mindset is is crucial to be successful. But at the same time, I, I do I do believe there needs to be a balance of gratitude in it. Mm. So so when you saying that, like, are you saying that you you didn't you weren't grateful for because there there is a component, right? Like you're giving a net. I mean, you, you're given a God given talent like this is your gift, like right. to be able to fly the way that you do like that is a God gift. But then, as you said, like you have worked tirelessly to perfect that. And that's what I tell people. It's like, and I don't know if you agree with this as an athlete. Like I always feel, and I'm of the mindset of someone who played sports growing up, never at any exceptional level, right? Let's get that out the way. And I'm okay <laughs> with that. I was, I was a team player. Like I was not the player. And, but I always tell people that I am a firm believer that you can be given this God-given talent, but if you're not willing to work and 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 and, and fine-tune that gift, yeah, the person that is not given the same gift but is willing to outwork you mm -hmm. will literally, you know, just trump you and essentially get that opportunity and succeed at it. Yeah, and and, and I don't know how you feel about that, right? I mean, so I think there's two parts of, of a question in there. One is is that question, but then also two, when you say about having this level of gratitude. Are you saying that because you kind of took this God-given talent for granted, you didn't necessarily appreciate what what the gift was? Yeah. No, I, I would say talent alone is definitely not enough because there are definitely going to be people out there who's willing to, to work harder than you. Um, and the, the essence of diligence and what I believe in is that you don't have to be perfect to do something great, but you just got to show up with your best and that best can turn into something excellent, right? And so that that's one area of, you know, understanding. Don't just rely on your talent, that thing that's just given to you. You gotta you gotta learn to nurture that thing and take care of it. And and then to answer that other question, becoming the sixth fastest man in the world, when that happened for me, my mom she was in the stands, sold out crowd. And let me, let me take you two weeks back from that. Two weeks back from that, I injured myself. I, I had a hamstring injury and this, this is what happened. USA track and field, they wanted me to give up my spot. 
they said the chances of you coming back is impossible. And what was that injury? It was a hamstring injury. And I, and I injured myself at a like a kind of like a warm up track meet to get tuned up for the biggest stage of my life. End up injuring myself. I was getting ready to run 19 seconds. I <laughs> felt like it. Wow. And um, that happened. They told me, hey, give up your spot, you know, do the American thing because somebody's a little healthier than you and they have a better shot right now. Oh. And, you know, I was like, I can't, I, I, I spent my whole life trying to get to this very moment. You mean to tell me you want me to give it up? And no, I can't do it. And every single day I did rehab, I was working on myself. All that same energy that I put into making a team, I put into a rehab program. So I was icing, stretching, seeing my physiologist, doing everything I needed to do. And I end up that day of that race, I wasn't 100 percent, but I was I was showing up. I was going to do, do the best that I can. And I end up making it all, all the way through those rounds. It was four rounds back in the day and um, made it through those rounds. And when I crossed that finish line, I was pissed. I was mad. I was mad because I didn't get top three. Mm. And you, after all of that I've been through and I had the, had the audacity or, you know, had the, the, the grace to, to be given that opportunity to still be able to run and I still couldn't be thankful. And so that's what I'm talking about. When you, you got that dog in you, like, I want to win. And looking back at it now, you know, for my mom to be in the stands, cheering me on. <laughs> she told me, she told me uh, when she was up in the stands, you know, it was people all around from different countries and they were cheering my name too. They were like, Charlie, Charlie, go Charlie. <laughs> oh, hey. My name is Charles, right? <laughs> and yet I couldn't find the joy in that because I saw, I saw that out. I, I felt like I wasn't good enough. Did your mom pull a, a, a like a, a Patrick Mahomes where she started looking around like, don't call him Charlie. I don't call him Charlie. You know, Patrick Mahomes, his mom tweeted everybody like, I wish you guys would stop calling him. I think they were calling him Pat. And she oh. was like, his name is not Pat. His name is Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> now, my mom just laughed in the stand. She was enjoying herself. <laughs> and, I mean, look, uh, the idea that there's people from around the world right. that know you, right? And even if they're saying Charlie versus Charles, right? Like still, like, you know that they're rooting for you. That in itself is an incredible experience and a feeling right. to have. Yeah. So, you know, you talk, you, you talk about this element of, you know, not being able to have that gratitude that you were almost not even going to be able to do that race at all. Like to even cross mm -hmm. the finish line to fulfill those four races because of the possibility of them pulling you off of the squad, right? Your slot right. being taken up. And, you know, so how do you, wh what happened in life that gave you this ability to be able to have that, that, that gratefulness, that gratitude for the opportunity to be a part of a process? I think it takes a series of, of things to happen. I got humbled in life and I think everybody has their moments of being humbled in something, right? <laughs> and and to me, it was after I became the sixth fastest man in the world, I was projected to sign a million dollar deal after college. One single season I had left and in the blink of an eye, it was all gone. Hmm. I, I suffered a debilitating injury. Doctors told me, Charles, you'll never be able to run as fast as you did. I went from being one of the fastest men in the world I couldn't even stand on my own. Wow. And so I moved back at home, my mom, trying to figure out my life. And I remember I was sitting at the bottom of her steps. She never seen me so broken. And you know, the idea of a, a mother, she wants to just love her son and love on their kids, right? But the the thing is, like I was a grown man. She couldn't she couldn't love that situation the way she would normally love it by fixing it, right? I, I had to realize that was on me. Mm -hmm. And so that mindset shifted from why me to it's, it's on me. It's on me. I, I had to take ownership first. So I think ownership has to come first. And then the other thing is 
realizing the little things in life. When that moment happened, nobody knew that all I wanted for myself during that time was to, to be on my own, was to make my family proud, live in a one bedroom apartment on my own with me and my dog Flash. And I like that. Is he just as fast as you? Just as fast, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so I got had an opportunity to, say, uh, to to speak at my alma mater and spoke on that stage. Teenage girl, she came up to me. She said, what you said on that stage, it changed my life because I felt like killing myself today. But you make me want to live my dream. And how old are you at this time? I was 24. 24. 24, yeah. And that's when I started my nonprofit. Started my nonprofit at that time. And she made me see that it was so much bigger than me. And I think that's the stages of seeing purpose in your life. Purpose is about being connected to life, but also doing things that gives you life. Mm -hmm. And she made me see that, and life is so much bigger than what you think it is. You don't have to have these gold medals to be respected and appreciated. You don't have to make a certain salary. You don't have to have this certain body image. You don't have to look a certain way for people to love you, for, for, for you to give life to situations. You as you are is good enough. Hmm. And that was a, a very humbling moment. And I realized in that, that when you put other people first and you make yourself second, you can still win. Mm -hmm. It's just as good. So my sixth place finish didn't matter anymore. So at that point, was your running career over like the doctors had mentioned you'll never be as fast as you once was mm -hmm. went back home you know you're kind of trying to figure it all out is is it is the assumption that your running career at least in that particular opportunity was done like someone else had taken that slot or yeah. you know they kind of reserved it for whoever the next person that would come up I, it wasn't it wasn't over i still I persevere is my big thing right uh, i think you persevere until you realize there's something better out there Mm -hmm. And I, I retired 2016 and I injured myself 2010. So okay. during that time, I am, I am learning myself. And I, I think my mindset, when all these, all that stuff was happening, it, it truly made me see that I, that we all can be resilient, mm -hmm. you know, um, even in the hardest times. In a different game, right? Yeah, in a different sport, right? In anything, because your sport, you you knew you were resilient when it came to track and field. Yeah, like you knew you got, you knew you had that on lock. You knew that that you were automatic, where you could bounce back from anything and still show up, right? Like you had right. proven to yourself over the course of your career that okay, on on the track, I'm good, right? But you hadn't proved it to yourself off the track at yeah. least it seems that way right or it sounds that way well i mean i think that's the biggest struggle for a lot of athletes we 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 can't adapt to turn that that great thing that you were that you were known for in college and in high school to use it on another platform to right. use it in your relationships to use it on your job to use it on yourself and i i saw it it was like boom brother come on like you are so tough in track. You will get full body cramps. You will step up for somebody else. You can do the same thing in, in what you're experiencing right now with yourself. Huh. So that girl coming up to you when you're 24 years old yeah. and literally telling you, you saved my life. I mean, that's essentially what she said. Like you saved my life. Like I was thinking about committing suicide Yeah, Most and I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. What happened after that? What happened to Charles after that? I mean, because I remember, and I'll show personally, I remember I was already doing like speaking. I already was passionate about this, this space. And I remember um, about seven years after I was injured, I was living in LA at the time. A friend of mine reached out and said, hey, will you go speak at my daughter's high school? And I was like, yeah, you know, I'll do it. I'll do it. Right. And, um, and I remember that when the, when the time finally came 
I had that, that day I was like, man, I don't want to do this. Yeah. Like I just kind of didn't have the energy for it. I was like, but you know, I gave my word. So I go down to the school and I get on stage and something happens, right? Like I just get this energy, right? Like I'm, and, and, and the, the, the difference was, is that I, I, I wasn't like in a, in a corporate setting. I was in with a bunch of high schoolers, right? So it was fun. It was light. You know, I could joke around and right. I could be my natural self. And then when I was done, this girl was literally crying. Like I was like talking to some of the kids and this girl's like crying. And, I'm like, and I didn't say anything to her. I literally just hugged her. Mm. That's all I did is just hugged her. Cause I was like, I don't, I don't know what it is. This girl does, this girl does not need someone to ask her what it is. I felt she needed a hug. Mm -hmm, and and, and mm -hmm. so I just gave her a hug and then I pulled back and I said, whatever it is, it's going to be okay. Whatever it is. Well, she stuck around with some other kids we were chatting. Well, then I get a letter. I get a letter about, I don't know, two, three weeks later. Yeah. I get a letter from that girl. And she says, I was the girl that was crying. She identifies herself. And she says, you don't know this, but I have been contemplating suicide. Mm. And I can tell you that, uh, let's see, let me do the math real quick. So I was older than, than I think I was 26. I was 26, right? So two <laughs> years older than the experience you had at 24. Yeah. Six years old, and I know how it affected me. I know how it hit me. I know, I know what it did for me. Yeah. But you're 24. How, like, how did that hit you at 24, bro? I mean, it made my situation so small. Mm. Like, let me think about that. Like, yeah, perspective. I injured myself, tore my quad completely, moved back at home with my mom, didn't even have a car to drive myself to that event, feeling like the lowest of the low, rock bottom. And it dissolved the moment she told me that. Wow. And you can you, wow. you tell me you can't get over your situation. There's people listening today, right now. There's something that you just need to show up for. And ah, that feeling of you not feeling enough, that feeling of you not feeling appreciated, not having value or trying to understand purpose, it will go away. You just gotta show up. Hmm. Like, cause I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing anyway when I was speaking right. on stage. I was just saying whatever. I don't even remember what I said. I just showed up. Yeah, I, I, I'm guilty for doing the same thing. I just rolled up and then I was like, I, luckily I had a little bit of experience with speaking. So I was yeah. like, I, I, once I got there, I kind of got a little, you know, I got going. Yeah. But when I rolled up, like, I, I didn't know what I was going to say. And I just got there and the kind of the moment kind of took over. But you're right, man. You showed up. Mm -hmm. And there's so many of us that are just refusing to show up, are refusing to just get out of the space that we're in and just kind of go to the box next to us and say, what's going on in here? Let me figure this out. Let me let me try to surround myself with some energy from a different part of the world that might be able to give me some insight, right? And 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 that's so key. Um, I, I love that you talked about just showing up. So what happened? What would you do after that? Like you left, eventually you left. Like, how'd you get there? You said you didn't have a car. Your mama drive you? My, my mama let me use her car. I had to take my mom to work that day. That day. <laughs> she said, "My car. When I get my car back, it better not be on empty." <laughs> I got that She's like, I get off at. Yeah, yeah. You gotta be here ten, 10 minutes before. 10 minutes before. <laughs> <laughs> you better be I here ten minutes before because I might get done early. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you get back in your mama's car, you leave the school. I'm sure you have this huge smile on your face. I'm sure you were just like, depending on what, what time of year was it? What time of the year was it? Do you remember? Uh, definitely. It was cold. It was, it, it was cold. cold. Okay. So I was going to say, you probably had the windows down, feeling good. Now you had the windows up yeah, and you had the heat on, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm sure you left with the huge, the biggest grin on your face as you're driving to one, put gas in the car because you can't yeah. show up you yeah, know, yeah. with it all empty. And then when you picked up your mom or did you, did you pick up your mom right away? Or did you, was there like a little time gap? I, I stuck around cause I took some, you know, I was taking the photos and you know, uh, my mom got off at about five o'clock. So, 
Yeah, I had some time. I had some time. So, so when you when you get in the car and you have a now you now you're not around the kids, you're not around, you know the 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 admin of the school. You were just by yourself. Take me to that place. I don't. I don't think it was a smile. I think it was a sense of peace because hmm. I was um, I was fighting with life, and it was just overwhelmed, bro. Like. Being at the top to being at the bottom. And then it was just a sense of peace. Like, it don't matter, Charles. Hmm. That was your moment. That's that's what you should do. That's how you should show up. And even though I was still running, it was like, I asked myself, like, how can I, how can I continue to get that feeling? How can I continue to be second to make people win? And that don't mean me losing a race, though. <laughs> All right. How can, I, how can I do that? So that that was like I was testing the limits at this point. I'm like, yo, okay, you know what? This practice is going to be for for Virginia who has cancer, and I'm a fight. I'm a fight this one out for her. That last set is going to be for her. Oh. I was finding my ways to to insert purpose to exist for not just myself, but be connected to something so much more so now you were racing not just for not for the for the million dollar deal you're racing for a million dollar purpose and a million dollar feeling mm -hmm. for, one. And, for one and 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 everybody you had encountered and everyone you were still encountering were now the ones that were fueling that drive fueling that purpose mm -hmm. so, so take me take me because you're still running as you said um so are you now like or because I, you went to florida state right mm -hmm. and you're running at florida state so at this point i mean you're you're obviously out of florida state what's going on with your running career like you bounce back from this injury you're still running what's going on with it i had like little little moments of like, oh, it's going to get better. Like, I wasn't the fastest in the world, but I was, you know, I was making it to USA championships and just couldn't find that stride back. So I said to myself, 2016, if I don't make the USA track and field team this time, I'm going to, I'm going to transition out and I'm going to speak full time. And that's literally what I did. And uh, I said, I was going to move to Tampa, start my business, meet my wife. Move to Tampa, I started my business, and I met my wife, my beautiful. Oh, man. And when I, um, when, I, when I first was getting into it full time, I'll tell you this story. I was doing Toastmasters. Because, you know, when, I, I'm, when I'm getting into something, I'm going to get all the way in it because I want to be the best that I can be. Right. And I get into it, make it to nationals for their Toastmasters contest. And this is, brings me back to gratitude. And um, I, I feel like I gave the best speech of my life. The judges announce, announces the, the winners and my name wasn't called. That feeling that I felt like I was, ah, oh, that was the best speech of my life, gone. Head down, sad. <laughs> yeah. Brought me back to that moment you gonna let that define you? And so gratitude is very simple to find. You gotta look inward to find it. It's not gonna be defined by somebody else, by some material thing, object. It's asking yourself simply, how did that make you feel? Hmm. Can you find joy in this moment? What is that thing? Hold on to it. And from then, you won't be looking for validation. So do you feel like when you were on that Toastmasters journey, trying to compete for nationals, yeah. do you feel like it was coming naturally to you to speak and to share and to you know, impact people that you didn't appreciate that? There are other people equally working as hard. Like you, did you did you kind of just filter in and think, oh, this is just one of those things that I'm just really good at, and it's just going to take over, like it, like my running career has done. 
I'm just going to succeed at it. And so you, even though you had learned the lesson to a degree after your injury and when you went to that school and spoke, you hadn't learned it completely. I think, you know, we all, nobody has it figured out in case you, you don't know that y'all. <laughs> right. We're all trying to become and becoming means it's always going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so those fears that you have, you might have conquered one area of it, but it's going to keep showing up in different parts of your life. You know, so I say that because there's always going to be a, a, a deeper level of yourself that you need to connect to. And those challenging moments are going to expose that. Mm -hmm. Those challenging moments where, where you don't get it right, that's going to decide the character that you have and the measure of your character will be the measure of your success. Mm -hmm. So how I chose to handle that was going to decide my success later. Hmm. So Toastmasters, your name isn't called, you're defeated. What happens then? I think it was, I think I got in my car and I sat there for a moment. This time, one of my friends, they supported me. And I was like, what? What am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing? I, 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 can't, I can't do that. It, it was, it, so like, I think the process happens quicker, right? We can go back, we can go to those different emotions. We'll feel those emotions, but how how quick can you get out of it? Mm -hmm. You know, you may be mad you lost, but how, how quick can you get out of it? Can you pivot mm -hmm. from that? Mm -hmm. And I was in my car, immediate pivot, found joy, moved on with my life. You know, that's 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 great. You were able to do that because I mean, I know myself. Um I mean, even till today, despite the amount of speeches that I've given and I've done, but I could definitely talk about when I first started. Yeah. You know, speaking is not easy because as you are well aware, there's a tremendous amount of vulnerability that comes with it. And you have to be willing to be vulnerable and expose elements of your life when everything wasn't figured out and perfect. Um, and, and then bring people on that journey of how, what you learned and then what you've learned and how you maybe prevented it from happening again. But to, but to put yourself in a space, be vulnerable and then to not be, not to receive like a standing ovation or to not have your name called. I mean, man, that, that could be, that could, that could be a punch. Mm -hmm. I mean, that could be a punch that would be hard for a lot of people to bounce back from. Um, which is to me, when I, when I hear that story, it, it feeds into this narrative that I always used to, I, I still believe that as a, someone who played sports, yeah. I believe a lot of lessons that sports taught me, the, the, the situations that I, that I was in, I just, I brought it over into life, right? Like, Hey, you're going to have a bad play. You're going to make a mistake, right? You're not going to run your best race like you. Um, but there's another, there's another meet, you know, there's another play. There's, you know, like the challenging thing here for, in comparison to the sports that I played, it was a team. Mm -hmm. But when I started speaking, it was just me. It was just me on a stage. There was no team. It was yeah. me. And if I didn't get that standing ovation, if my name wouldn't have been called, <sighs> man, that's hard. Right. I mean, th th that that's hard to take that hit. The, the way I kind of look look at it, like I think those are great goals to get to get that standing though. But when I speak on the stage, it's like I'm a part of their team now. Mm -hmm. So I look for those moments to how how can we like yo how can we bring this all in together? Individually, I got to do my part, but. That's not the, my end goal is not to stand and know is did I make the team win at the end of the day? Uh -huh. And that takes away for me that, that desire to, you know, stand and know, yeah, 
yes, baby, yes. <laughs> I still want to feel it, though. Right. Oh, at the end of the day, did the team win? Hmm. That's what I'm asking myself. And I think team winning, it could be different things. Like, did one person connect with me? Did the event planner come after the event and, and, and tell me this was exactly what we needed to hear? Because those are the greater moments of, of purpose, of gratitude, of happiness, fulfillment, you know, all those things. That right here, that that feeling of that standing no, it'll feed my ego, but it won't feel my it won't feed my purpose. Mm. Mm. To me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that uh, I know I made early on in my speaking career. Yeah. I'd get on a stage, whether it was 50 people or 5,000 people, yeah. and I I would speak as if I was speaking to every single one of them. I mean, you hear my tone, and I'm, like, yelling. I mean, like, meanwhile, I'm wearing a microphone. Like, why are you yelling? Like, you know, they can hear you through the speakers. Yeah. But I, I, I approached every speech as if I wanted every single person when I was done to walk away feeling, wow, like this wow element that like I was moved and inspired or whatever I wanted them to feel. You want to see it on their face too, right? <laughs> yeah, I want to see. Oh, yo, which was so hard, yo, to be honest. When I joined all my children, I started acting. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I was doing a speaking thing. And so I was so accustomed that at the very least, people would still stand up and give me love, you know, after I was mm -hmm. done speaking. And I remember when I got on set one of the first few times and the director was like, all right, you're, great job. All right, cool. Like, all right, uh, ne moving on to next scene. And then I was like, standing <laughs> like, that's it. Like, there's no standing up. Like, no, 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 no one's going to clap for me. No one's going <laughs> to. That's it. Like, wait a minute. Like, what do you like? And that was an adjustment for me because, you know, they're like, no, nah, man, we got other people we got to get to, other scenes we got to, you know, uh, shoot. Um, so, so, you know, what happens after that? Like, I mean, what, how do you, because you clearly decided that you wanted to do this, you wanted to be a speaker. Um, you didn't quit on that. I mean, you're still on that journey right now. I mean, but, mm -hmm. but, after, how do you pull yourself from that space of, man, I didn't, my name wasn't called, but I'm not going to give up on this? It, it's, it's tapping into your greater self. Every single day, I'm just looking to become an ounce more of who, I, who I'm created to be. And, and so to me, it's reading books. It's doing intentional events. It's getting coached, having mentors. And... I think through that that growth process, you learn, and then it gives you experience, right? And that experience gives you something to talk about. Hmm. And I realized, hey, I got a lot to I got a lot to talk about, and a lot of the things that I talk about deals with adversity. How can we overcome this? And so that's my that's my platform that I stand on. Adversity. I want to show people how they can get through those hard times, those rock bottom moments and find their greater self because our, our greatest strength is going to not come from the success that we have, but it's through that adversity that we encounter. Mm. Yeah. There's a, I had a gentleman on the podcast. He was a, a Vietnam prisoner of war for six years and, uh, he he has so many incredible sound bites, but um, a sound bite that my wife really loves, and and she would always repeat it. And he said that adversity is a horrible thing to waste. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. And it's it's true, right? Like it's true. So many of us look at adversity as this barrier and it's the thing that life is against us and the world is against us and people are against us. Um, Yet it sounds like you are in a place of your life where you're like, okay, adversity. What do I need to learn in this moment? That's what true. do I need to pay attention to in this moment? How do I, you know, pivot in this moment? So l let's talk a little bit about this adversity. As you said, that's your platform. Yeah. Uh, what do you share with people when people are, you know, coming to you from all different walks of life that are dealing with all sorts of adversity, whether it's a young girl that is 
contemplating suicide or it's a, a biz, an entrepreneur that started a business that isn't doing that well, uh, or maybe is doing incredibly well, or a mother who's having a chat, like, how do you connect and relate to every single one of these people from all different walks of life? But the one thing that brings you all together is adversity. Yeah, I think adversity is a layer of cognitive dissonance. And that's where our values aren't in alignment with our our success that we that we want to have, or our actions aren't in alignment uh, with what we say. Hmm. And so we got to learn to to align those things to drive success, right? And I mean, there's there's so many things, and I, but I think the the basis of it is accept the process, hmm. and. What I mean by that is you have to equate for the adversity that's going to come. No matter if you get to the highest place of, of your career, no matter if you are starting from the very bottom, account for the adversity. Because that adversity is, is the thing that you need to go to the next place. If you never experienced adversity in your process, the process hasn't made you yet. Hmm. You got to be built by it. You know, when you think about like a caterpillar, that, that caterpillar is so compelled to go through a transformation. It's going to eat so much food to to get fat, right? Like a hundred times its size. Mm-hmm. And then it's going to get in this cocoon phase to where he literally eats him up his his self. And in that process, you ever thought, thought about that? Like, like what happens to that caterpillar, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> he, got, he he eats himself. And that is the process where he then becomes that butterfly. That's a painful process, right? Mm-hmm. And the question that I ask people is, when was the last time you endured pain and you went through it and that process made you better and made you stronger? So you got to be willing to en- endure that hardship. That's, that's the thing. It might set you back right now, but it, it's going to be the thing that catapults you forward. If you go through it right now, because like, again, you go through the, the hard times, the process will get easier and your mentality will adapt to see opportunity and not the obstacle. You got to go through the hard time. Right. That's meant for you. That's that salt. See my grandma, she makes this mean sweet potato pie and the sweet potato pie isn't good until she adds the salt. It's crazy, right? I mean, mm-hmm. you're dealing with something sweet. You're dealing with the sweet potato, the sugar, right? The vanilla extract and the butter, all of that. And then you want to, why are you adding salt to the situation? Mm-hmm. But that's the thing that's going to bring everything together. Mm-hmm. And every time she makes it and she adds that little pinch, it's perfect. So as much as you want to try to not bring your pain and to your story, your pain is going to be the thing that helps you get to that next stage. Whatever it is, incorporate your salt. Because when I first started speaking, this, I was mad. I was compartmentalizing my salt. Nobody knew I lived at home with my mom. I was borrowing her car. Nobody knew those things that I desired for myself. And I was so far away from it. I wanted to be on the Wheaties box at that age of my life. <laughs> But I'm, I'm leaving dirty cereal bowls in my mama's sink. And I'm like, this can't, this can't be life. <laughs> but, I, but the moment I started to incorporate my salt, my story, I went from being a, a free speaker, a speaker that speaks for free, mm-hmm. to a paid speaker that people will pay for to sit in that seat to hear me. Because you knew your story, you had, you had gone through, you endured it, I didn't and as like you said earlier, that you had that experience now. And and I didn't hide that story. Mm-hmm. You, you, everybody wants to talk about the success, but they don't want to talk about their story. Right. Like the story before you were successful. Right. That that time you almost felt like you know giving giving up on your your life. Yeah. That time you know when when I was at the top of of the top and, Oh, wait a minute. You didn't know about the story where after I injured myself 
And my coach wanted me to, to, to go to nationals with them. And I said, no, that story that you had, people need to know about that too. Hmm. They, they, they need to know you're ugly because there's something that you learned in those ugly moments that makes you who you are now. Hmm. Why'd you say no? I said no, because I, I saw all of my, all of my needs. I said no, because I was hurting. I wanted to be somewhere in my life and I was so far from it. And it would pain me to watch somebody else do what, do what I was called to do. I didn't want to deal with the media asking me, how does it feel? I didn't want to deal with none of that. So mm -hmm. I, said, I said, no, everybody kept asking me. I said, no, I can't do this. But I, I, I missed the opportunity to, to do something that was bigger than me. The, the, that lesson came later, right? <laughs> Putting yourself second, that's mm -hmm. the real thing that I live for now. How can I put myself second and so that other people can win? And it's easy to get caught up in yourself, right? It's, it's easy to see all your needs and not see the noble act of bravery and humility and selflessness. Mm -hmm. Again, your character is so important. And when you have a character for the things that you want in your life, it'll come to you. It'll come to you. So now you're, as you stated, not a free speaker. Now, now you get paid. Now you make a living doing this. Um, how, I mean, there's challenges there, right? Getting into this space and understanding your own value and the value of your experience, the value of your story the value of your time. Yeah. Uh, what, what were some of the challenges that you faced crossing over from being an athlete now uh, to becoming a paid speaker? Man, I think the challenges are all the same, honestly. It's just a different space. Hmm. And the challenge that I first faced was I was working at Dick Sporting Goods when I moved to Tampa. This is my raw story, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and um, I said, uh, man, if I just get one speaking engagement, I'm going to quit this job. And I'm going to do what I love. I'm going to do what I love. I got that one, I got that one speaking engagement. $2,500. i never forget it. I spoke. Did you quit? I quit the job. Yeah. Quit the job. But guess what? Adversity came knocking. Adversity came knocking. It came quick too. I didn't even open, I didn't even get to cash the check yet. Adversity came for a whole <laughs> a whole four or five months go by. Not one speaking engagement. I'm like, my roommate about to be mad at me because we about to get evicted. I ain't got no more cash. And um, I said, uh, I gotta start submitting my resumes. I gotta I gotta get a corporate job or something. So I submitted my resumes. And I had an opportunity to, to take him for an interview. And then the guy was just like, yo, I don't know if God talks like that, but he was, he was saying, yo, don't do it. Keep showing up. And I kept showing up. I said, hey, I can't take these interviews. I'm sorry. Got to go. And I remember this day. Biggest day. One of the biggest moments of my life. I um, had... My clients, all of them say yes at one time. And I cashed $25,000 in the bank. Ooh. Now, but here's the thing. It ain't about the money. It's about that process. Mm -hmm. If you don't go through it in the hard times, you can't get built by it. Mm. You will never arrive to that moment that you want. That process, literally, I'm telling you, Anything that you want in life, that process has to build, break you down and to build you up. And that process had you sweating because, you, like you said, you thought you were going to be evicted. And, no, and look, my dog Flash, he won't going to be eating. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be some problems in that household. <laughs> so, you know, you know, you had to literally, you know, that, that that's the thing. But why are we so inclined, Charles? Why are we as human beings so quick to 
avoid and run away from that adversity. The very thing that you're telling us that we should run towards Mm -hmm. at whatever speed you can, (laughs) but you're, you know, we're so inclined and, and programmed to avoid it. Why are we programmed to avoid it? And how do we break that program and download a new software? Because, because our, our, our mama made us that way, or your daddy made you that way, your your close friends made you that way. You embrace their fears, and you realize that I I I, I can't get uncomfortable because they never got uncomfortable with it. Uh. But but fear is is not something that you should be afraid of. Is something well. There's certain fears that you should be, you know, aware of and afraid of. But the fears, like I'm afraid of snakes. Like that ain't. I, 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 there's nothing you're gonna do that's I'm gonna change jumping, that. I am jumping like, like I don't know. I'm out of here. No sense. <laughs> like, like if I saw a snake right now, I might be the sixth fastest man in the world. Like I might, I might right. be the seventh, but I'll be close. I'm out of here. Like, no, <laughs> but um, those fears are are good for us. Those fears keep us alive. But then we have these fears that we think if we, the fears of our goals, and we think by staying away from it, it's going to allow us to live. But that's boring, you know? And that's not the thing that's gonna give us life. If we are living life to be connected to life and to give life, then you will never wanna live in fear a day in your life. And when you make that decision, it will be scary. But that's that's a part of the deal. And I'm sorry, there's no other way around it. I'm not sorry, honestly. But there's no other way around it. Right. We just have to go through it. And right. it will be the most satisfying, satisfying feeling of your life when you make it through. If you're willing to submit to that process, you're going to get through it. So Charles, Charles Clark for, you know, you'd say a good number. when did you start running? When did you realize that this was your gift and this is what you wanted to pursue? How old were you when you realized, Oh, I'm fast. Fifth grade, fifth grade field day. I was um, running on, um, and they, this was to be the fastest kid in, in the school. And my, my friend, my best friend, Andre at the time, he was like, Hey, pretend like, Aisha's down there. Aisha was a girl I had a crush on. Pretend like Aisha's down at that cone. I want you to run as fast as you can. And so I ran. I ended up winning. And it was like, yo, this kid got the juice. So that's when I realized I I had a gift at at running. And um, I just embraced it from then because I wasn't good at much, man. I I struggled with reading and writing, dyslexic, all of that stuff from K to 12. And this was the thing that I was going home. Mm-hmm. This, oh, man, this is, this is good. I got, I got to do whatever it takes to be great at that. Cause I don't see nothing else. <laughs> right. Right. So you're, you're 10 or 10, roughly 10 years old, fifth grade. Yeah. You, you, you realize, oh, this kid's got the juice and then it becomes, it, it kind of, be, it becomes your identity for the next, you know, 15 Give or take, how how old were you when you retired? Nineteen years, Something nineteen, like like nineteen years. So nineteen years of your life, it it became your identity. It consumed you. Yeah. And now, here, when when so you were an athlete. That was your identity. You are an athlete. You are a fast guy. That's your identity. That's who you are. But now, in this new space, you've had to reinvent yourself, right? Which you, we talked about earlier about what athletes have a challenging time with being able to essentially kind of shed that skin and to be able to kind of say, okay, I'm going to put on, I'm going to create a new uh, layer of skin, a new identity for myself. Um, but, but here you are now having re-identified yourself, having created this new person, this new image that is content and you, and with, with yourself is content with what you're doing is content with, if you don't necessarily like like adversity now is not a big deal for you, really, right? Like it's fair to say that. Uh, it's always going to be a big deal. You got to have the mindset to endure it, though. Right. 
it's going to break you again and again because there's always going to be something new, something challenging, but it's going to break you, but it's going to build you up to be stronger. Right. So next time you do go through it, it won't affect you as it did before. Because mm. right. after you know going through what I went through, not much affects me now. I, 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 I know like there's a lot of stuff going on politics and you know Black Lives Matter. It it, it hits me, but it don't break me like it did. If I never went through those those things that I that I've been through in my life, I'd be soft. For real, straight up, I I, I would be soft. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people are soft because they they never want to go through the process. Right, right. Go through it. Like, get get your wings. Hmm. Because the more you go through, though, there's a layer to you. There's a layer to self, myself, right? And you know, to answer those questions that you have, you said, did, did I did I find more of who I am, my identity? And I think honestly, I was I was covering up my identity. You know, it was. Think of it like a marble rock. There's certain parts of the of a sculpture that are 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 not necessary to 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 create, and so we gotta chip away at certain things to uncover who we are. So I think during that process, I was chipping away at those things that didn't really matter. Huh. The gold medal didn't. The gold medal didn't matter. That injury did not define me. I'm chipping away at it gratitude all of these things I'm, I'm chipping away i'm and i'm and the more you go through the process you you are molding who you are all, all who, who you are ultimately designed to be that never I always, I always tell people like it's important to it's important to have a long-term goal yeah but you, but i feel like in order to gain that confidence mm -hmm. you have to focus on the small victories Mm -hmm. Right. But in, the, in, in in hindsight, they're small victories in comparison to the bigger picture. But when the moment they're big victories, but you have to focus on those little victories. Right. That that give you um, that continue to give you life mm -hmm. that 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 reminds you of what you're doing and why you're doing it. Right. Like, isn't that what you say that w would you agree with that statement? Yeah, I, I think we have to be visionary and you doing anything great. You have to be a visionary. You have to see where you're going and you got to know how to get there. Mm -hmm. And that stuff is calculated. You know, micro goals is, is important. So even though I, you know, I want to become, let's say, a New York Times bestselling author, there's some micro goals that I got to reach. I got to finish chapter one by next month in right. order to finish that book by March the 20th, you know? Right. But there's certain things that are essential and yeah, fine, gratitude and, and those little victories. You did it. You you are a step closer. Most people won't take those steps. So Charles, where can people find you? Where can people connect with you? Tribe. Y'all can find me on Instagram at the Charles Clark or Clubhouse at the Charles Clark. Um, and um, yeah, I'd love to connect with you guys. If you got any questions you want to get answered. Feel free to drop in my DM, ask me a question. I'd love to get back to people. And um, hey, if you are interested in setting up your 90-day plan of action for the new year or you know, you got some goals that you want to accomplish, check out my Thrive Planner. It's a 90-day planner designed to move big goals towards the finish line. Nice. Well, Charlie, <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad your mama let you borrow that car. Hey, for real. Hey, to go to that school. And to speak to those kids. And I'm glad that that girl came up to you afterwards and told you what she told you because, man, you're doing the work right now. And uh, I know as a speaker, it's not easy, especially during these times where, you know, th th since 2020, it's caused all of us to pivot from the speaking space that we're so accustomed to being in front of people. Um, I know you're pivoting uh, and I know you're doing, you're doing virtuals too, right? Like you're, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's, again, that's what people ask me. Well, how, from a business standpoint, Jared, how have you adapted? I'm like, listen, this is what, this is what my, 
you know, my whole life has been about this. Yeah. My whole life has prepared me for this moment. And everything I'm going through this moment is preparing me for whatever the next thing is going to, you know, present itself because there's always going to be something. And the minute that we understand that relationship, that it's gone, it, it is like a clock, yeah. right? It just keeps, it's constant, right? Like as long as there's batteries in it, the hands keep moving, it comes around to the bottom, to the top, it keeps moving. Right. And so yeah. we just got to keep showing up with the new fresh pair of batteries, man. Yeah. And we'll be all right. But I'm glad that I'm glad you're doing what you're doing, man. It, it, it It's a pleasure um, to have spoken to you. Thank you so much for your willingness to be vulnerable with me and the listeners, because it's hard to put yourself out there. It's, it's hard. To, it's hard. And, you know, 2020 was, was the year of the mask, right? Everybody was learning about a mask and having to wear a mask. And it's become so much part, so much of our identity that every day, every time we leave the house, we got to wear a mask. And the reality is most of us have been wearing masks all our lives. You know, most of us have been putting on a front and, and, you know, there's been that protection, that layer of protection that has prevented us from having to embark on this journey that is so needed for every single one of us to evolve into who uh who we're intended and supposed to be um but listen man i just i thank you it's a pleasure to have spoken to you i know that um you know for people for people listening right now be on the lookout because he had me on his podcast yes sir. And, uh, <laughs> i will be promoting that as well when it comes out once you give me the green light man but your podcast is is about talking about people that want to be speakers, right? And guiding them through that process. Yeah, how to find your voice, develop your message, and get consistently paid speaking gigs. You know, I really care about helping people break the silence, even if their voice shakes. And you feel like you got a story? Come with the tribe, because there's students out there who, who are just so encouraging in this community that we created, because most of them never told their story before. Uh -huh. And it's so liberating and it's such a gift to me to hear that story for the first time uh -huh. and guiding them through it is, man, it's so beautiful. I want to invite you in, man, to um, check out one of the... Yo, I'm already part of the tribe, so just kind of yeah. roll me in with the rest of the tribe. Like, I feel like I'm already part of the tribe, like, yeah. you know, so you just got to tell me when, hit me with a text, man, and I'm there, I'm game, because all right, all right, cool. just like you, it's all about impacting people, how what kind of difference can we make in somebody's life? That's what matters the most to me and to you. So, you know, Charles Clark, it was a pleasure, my man. Thank you so much for coming on the Rebirth Podcast and sharing a part of you. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll make sure people find you and connect with you and stay in touch. All right, brother. All right, take care. I'm sorry that you feel that way. Thank you all so much for joining Charles and me to learn about his rebirth journey. On today's episode, I've learned that his mindset of thrive is not just something that looks good on paper. It is something he lives by. I hope you all enjoyed this episode. Please be sure to share this episode with your friends and subscribe to the Rebirth Podcast. Until next time, this is Rebirth. Rebirth.